Okay, welcome everyone to uh, Icho Colloquium. Uh, our today's uh, speaker is um, <coughs> Brian uh, Osel Sakhman. <laughs> um, and uh, Narayan received his BS in 2016 at the University of Arizona. He then moved to Boulder to pursue his graduate studies in astrophysics in 2019. He joined the British level two program as a British Air, Air ambassador, taking an active role in the development of tools and techniques for the analysis of data from British and uh, other solar observatories, as well as mentoring the next generation of solar physicists. He currently works with Kevin Riordan at the National Solar Observatory, where he studies temperature diagnostics in the solar chromosphere and he hopes to defend his dissertation in summer of 2023. Uh, today, he will be speaking on probing chromospheric temperatures and dynamics with ALMA. Okay. All right, thank you for that introduction. Uh, thanks for having me here on such short notice. So yeah, let's get started. <clears throat> Uh, hello. <laughs> there we go. So, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with the chromosphere, but just to make sure that we're on the same page, uh, the chromosphere is the middle layer of the sun's atmosphere. Uh, if you've ever seen a total solar eclipse, and if you haven't, what are you doing? You really need to. <laughs> it's that pink fringe that you see during totality. Uh, it's it's where you have all these different phenomena like prominences, filaments, uh, spicules, uh, magnetic reconnection flares, all that stuff. Uh, it's also where a lot of uh, a lot of the physics of the solar atmosphere starts to change significantly from one regime to the other. So in the photosphere down low, uh, you have uh, high density, you have the uh, plasma more or less dominating the configuration of the magnetic field. So like uh, sunspots and pores and stuff, the structure of that is determined mostly by the motions, the fluid motions of the plasma. And up in the corona, higher up, uh, yeah, the shape of the uh, the motions of the fluid are determined by the configuration and motion of the magnetic field. And the chromosphere is sort of that transition between those two regimes. So a lot of your uh, your friendly assumptions like, uh, like, I don't know, local thermodynamic equilibrium, which has been so helpful for studying the photosphere, that doesn't hold in the chromosphere. Uh, what? So also in the chromosphere, the, uh, the magnetic field becomes, uh, like I said, a very important driver of structures and dynamics. Uh, it spreads out into this canopy. If you've ever seen this, uh, this cartoon from Wiedemeyer uh, in 2015, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here most importantly and most relevantly for uh, this project are the, uh, the fibrils and the waves. So you, you can see these, uh, these wave fronts propagating up from the photosphere upward. <coughs> and those are uh, mostly what we call the P modes. And then you have the of course, the fibrils above that stupid cursor. Sorry. So keep that in mind for later. So why do we want to study the chromosphere? Well, a lot of reasons. For one, uh, the chromosphere is really sort of the uh, the key to resolving a lot of longstanding uh, problems in solar physics, like the coronal heating problem. Uh, where does 
all this energy to uh, to heat the corona to upwards of a million degrees come from, uh, as well as things like space weather, uh, solar flares, coronal mass ejections, uh, with sort of things that can influence the uh, the uh, Earth uh, environment, uh, can influence the upper atmosphere, our communications. Uh, uh, rocket launches. I'm sure some of you heard about how last year uh, a bunch of Starlink satellites didn't make it to orbit because the ionosphere got puffed up by a by a uh, space weather thing. So definitely a lot of reasons to study the chromosphere, and also because it's weird, and I want to know why it's weird. Why can't that just be a good enough reason? <laughs> So how do we study the chromosphere? Well, unfortunately, we can't just stick a thermometer in or whatever and measure it directly. So we have to rely on remote sensing methods uh, like uh, continuum, radiation, spectral lines, that sort of thing. So specifically, spectral lines are really uh, useful for studying the solar atmosphere because they probe multiple different heights at once. So out of the wings, uh, you have uh, lower opacity. So you see further down into say the, uh, the bottom of the photosphere and then the line core where the opacity is higher, uh, you don't see as far down. So uh, you get multiple uh, heights sampled at once. Uh, and from those different heights and from the shape of the spectral lines, you can actually infer a lot of useful properties. Uh, most commonly, uh, you can get things like the velocity at various heights from the, uh, the Doppler shifting of the line. Uh, you can also get non-thermal velocities from the uh, non-thermal broadening, but that's more relevant in the, uh, in the corona. Uh, you can also measure the magnetic field uh, using the polarization state of that line, uh, whether that's using Zeeman splitting uh, for strong fields or uh, something more like the Hanley effect for weak fields. Uh, it's really hard to accurately measure the magnetic fields in the chromosphere. But uh, I hear Rebecca Centeno has done some uh, recent works that, uh, that sort of look at how we can approach that problem in terms of the, uh, the low polarization signals that we get. The really hard thing, or one of the really hard things to measure using spectral lines is temperature, uh, especially in the chromosphere, because uh, whereas down in the photosphere, for say the uh, iron 6302 lines, for example, the, uh, the line core intensity is very strongly coupled to just the local uh, gas temperature. But higher up, you start to get more influence from non-LTE effects. Uh, you also have to uh, deal with various confounding variables like the the whatever broadening of the line or multiple components uh, in the same resolution element. So that can make temperature a lot harder to reliably infer from spectral lines higher up. So to do that, to uh, to infer all of these properties, we generally rely on inversions which the basic concept of an inversion is given the value of an integral, you want to find what's inside that integral. So in this case, we're basically looking at how radiation coming up from the bottom of the solar atmosphere is modified as it propagates upward. And so effectively, we're integrating the various uh, 
the plasma the properties, the temperature, the velocities, the magnetic field, etc., over the uh, the range of heights that the uh, spectral line is sensitive to. And so if we observe a given spectral line profile, we want to back out from that. What are the physical conditions that produce that line shape? So uh, the way we do that is we start with a guess uh, model atmosphere and use radiative transfer calculations to, uh, to synthesize a spectrum from that atmosphere. And then we iteratively perturb that guess model uh, until, the, uh, until the synthetic spectrum more or less matches up as best we can with the observed spectrum. But there are some problems with this, uh, with this approach. For one thing, uh, it's really hard to uh, know for certain that you're deriving the right temperatures from your inversions, because among other things, uh, the radiative transfer calculations are just really, really complicated. In non-LTE specifically, uh, where you can't just assume that the local plasma properties are all that determine your atomic population levels. Uh, you have to take into account a lot more stuff and you can't just directly solve anything. So you have to do a bunch of different iterations of all of the uh, everything. And that's not not trivial, and it's not super numerically stable either. Uh, it's an ill-posed minimization problem as well, uh, especially with noisy spectra, where you're dealing with trying to tease out a little bit of polarization, or you're trying to you know, do something like that. Uh, you can end up with uh, multiple atmospheres multiple different stratifications of, say, temperature, velocity, magnetic field, et cetera, that can produce the same or indistinguishable within the noise level uh, observed spectra. So that's another big issue that you have to find a way to work around. Uh, so in general, non-LTE inversions especially tend to be very computationally expensive uh, yeah. for a, an idea that a single inversion of a uh, of spectral lines in non-LTE, depending on the lines and the atomic models you're using, can take anywhere from uh, one minute to many minutes per spectrum, and we can observe a million of those spectra in less than a minute. So there's a big, uh, big logistical problem with that. And on top of that, you don't even get a geometric height scale directly from these inversions. Uh, so it's not always super clear just from your results as the code spits them out, uh, whether, like how the, uh, adjacent pixels are connected to each other vertically, whether it's a smooth uh, height surface that you're looking at or whether it's a lot more irregular. So one way that we can try to uh, sidestep that issue or uh, attack it is with ALMA and the uh, millimeter continuum. The nice thing about uh, the millimeter continuum is that this is uh, radiation that is effectively formed in LTE, just from thermal Bremsstrahlung, and so it effectively acts as a sort of linear thermometer. So if you're seeing a certain intensity at a certain point on the sun at a certain uh, wavelength or frequency, then you can infer that uh, that corresponds directly to 
some specific temperature. So it's a much more uh, direct measurement than trying to infer temperatures from spectral lines. So what does Alma really see? Well, the problem here is that the uh, these uh, brightness temperatures, they don't arise from a single point. They arise from a uh, extended range of contributions in height along your line of sight. So uh, that's a uh, that's a big potential uh, problem that you need to be careful about when you're trying to interpret if you see uh, some uh, temperature distribution in your field of view. Uh, is that actually what the temperature is there, or are you averaging over hotter and colder regions? Uh, and what height are you looking at? So there's a couple of ways that you can potentially use ALMA uh, observations for testing these uh, inversions. One way is to just do the inversions and then compare them with a simultaneous uh, ALMA temperature map. The other way is to include the ALMA observations directly as an additional constraint in your inversions. And the uh, uh, Joao de Silva Santos has done some uh, really great works on that in recent years. Uh, so in particular, the, uh, the 1.2 millimeter continuum forms at about the same height on average as the calcium 8542 line. And the three millimeter forms a little bit higher up than that. So, and this is from simulations. Uh, so if we can try and, uh, if we can do those comparisons, then uh, maybe, maybe we can know how well are we actually doing with these inversions and measuring the temperatures. So to do that, we used these uh, observations from April 2017 of a little magnetic concentration uh, near an active region. This was observed with ILIS at the Dunn Solar Telescope. And we got observations in uh, hydrogen alpha, sodium D1, and calcium 8542. And we also got simultaneous observations with ALMA. We got a, a sequence in band six, which is 1.25 millimeter continuum, and a sequence with band three at a later time, in, which is three millimeter continuum. So uh, if you look at the, uh, the actual observations here, you can see the uh, you can see that the uh, the plage or what we're calling plage, this magnetic concentration here, uh, is at the center of the field of view, and that's what the uh, Alma fields of view are also focused on. The uh, smaller circle here is the uh, one point two five millimeter uh, field of view. And the larger circle is the three millimeter band three. And this is, is the full uh, IBIS field of view, but we just analyzed a uh, cutout, this square here for, the, uh, for our actual inversions. So when we were uh, initially testing our uh, inversion setup, we ran into a couple of issues. Uh, but most notably, uh, we found that in order to get the right uh, accurate temperatures from the inversions of the calcium line, we have to take into account uh, non-LTE ionization of hydrogen. So inversion codes uh, like STIC, which is what we used here, they normally treat hydrogen ionization just in LTE, so just 
assuming that the local uh, temperature is what determines the uh, ionization fraction of hydrogen. But the problem with that is that in the chromosphere, it's actually possible for radiation to escape upwards. And so you have less of a radiation field there and less ionization at a given temperature. And that ionization, the amount of free electrons, is part of what couples the, uh, the intensity of the calcium line to the local temperature of the gas. So if you have fewer electrons at a given temperature, then it turns out that you need a higher temperature in your atmosphere to reproduce the, uh, the shallowness of the calcium line. Unfortunately, this is very costly to implement, at least the way it's done in the current version of STIC. Uh, because it has to separately iterate the, uh, the hydrogen ionization and the electron densities. So that ends up costing like about five to eight times factor of uh, computation time. And it's also less numerically stable and more prone to uh, inversion noise. But if you want to do quantitative comparisons of chromospheric line derived uh, temperatures and ALMA observations, then you really do need to account for this physics. Uh, it looks like I'm uh, running shorter on time, so I'll just go through this quickly. Uh, so we also uh, took advantage of one of the options available in STIC, which is to use a different height scale. So normally inversions are done in optical depth, and that works great in the photosphere, but uh, that optical depth scale compresses the chromosphere. So whereas, say, the photosphere is about a thousand kilometers, give or take, and the chromosphere is 2,000, the, uh, the optical depth scale gives like three times as much uh, range to the photosphere as it does to the chromosphere. Uh, you can try and get around that with uh, an uneven placement of your nodes for your inversions, but you have to be careful to not influence the results you get. And especially for lines like the calcium infrared lines, uh, they're very sensitive to the temperature gradient as you go up from the temperature minimum into the uh, low chromosphere. And that's really hard to uh, reliably recover accurately uh, unless you uh, are very, very careful with where you place your nodes. So instead, we used column mass, which is just, uh, which is more or less a hydrostatic, the uh, stratified uh, height scale. And the nice thing about that is that it's, there's no sudden sharp jumps in how quickly it changes with height. It's much more smooth and it, we found that it works better for the chromosphere. So, uh, when we do our inversions of just the spectral lines and compare them to the ALMA observations, uh, we see uh, some interesting patterns for the uh, for the band three, the three millimeter continuum. Uh, which keep in mind that this is all at a lower uh, resolution than the IVIS observations. Uh, but we do see similar uh, large scale temperature structures like these fibril like structures down at the bottom edge of the plage. And you can see that the temperatures overall are nicely correlated. Uh, they are significantly higher in band three, uh, about two and a half thousand Kelvin higher, which you'd expect because we think from simulations that the uh, 
the three millimeter continuum forms higher up than the calcium infrared lines. Band six, on the other hand, uh, which we think should form at about the same range of heights as 8542. And you can see that the, uh, the mean temperatures are almost identical, but there's a lot less uh, correlation in the spatial structures. Uh, Wow, this monitor sucks. <laughs> in particular, you can see that in the band six image, there are these uh, hot spots here and here at the corners, and these really cold spots here at the top, like really cold, less than 3000 Kelvin even, that you don't see in the uh, calcium line. Uh, this is overall kind of surprising because, again, we would expect naively the uh, the band six to show similar structures overall. So, if we include the ALMA observations in our inversions, uh, we see some uh, different behavior. So, this is a, uh, a slice through the. Uh, the center of our inversions region. So going from north to south uh, through the middle of the network. And this is the, uh, the height in column mass. So photosphere is down here, chromosphere is up here, and this is temperature minimum. So if we include the three millimeter continuum in the inversions, then we get Mostly the same atmospheres as before, but just with higher temperatures at the top. So this is more or less just uh, enforcing that continuous temperature rise as you go into the higher parts of the chromosphere and towards the uh, transition region. And there's, there's no significant influence from the three millimeter on the uh, 8542 uh, inferred temperatures. Band six, on the other hand, uh, does something slightly different. So band six seems to affect the inferred temperatures at a wide range of heights. And most curiously, it seems to suggest the presence of pockets of very cold gas, again, around three or 4,000 Kelvin, sitting above the middle of this uh, this network region, which doesn't particularly make sense now, does it? So what's going on? Is this cold gas high in the chromosphere uh, real? Or is this just a result of uh, bad constraints in our uh, inversions, our regularization or node placement or something to that effect? Or is it just confusing the code with uh, conflicting information from the continuum and the calcium line? We do know that uh, band six does work well with, for instance, the, uh, the magnesium two H and K lines. Uh, and that's because more or less the band six formation heights happen to lie right between where the wings and the core of these lines form. So in that sense, it's just filling in information that is not accessible to the spectral lines, much like the band three does for the 8542 line. So what is Alma really telling us? Well, we say that it's a linear thermometer, but it's not uh, super clear what it's actually measuring. Uh, is whether it's a local measurement or how wide of a range of heights, how many different temperatures are contributing to that, uh, at what heights in general, uh, especially if you look at uh, simulations like uh, this is from Bfrost, 
you can see just how wide a range of heights the uh, millimeter continuum can form from. And in particular for the one millimeter, uh, just how sort of bimodal this uh, range of formation heights can be. Uh, then there are other uh, simulations that include physics like non-equilibrium, so time-dependent ionization effects, that uh, would suggest that they should form much closer together, the band three and the band six, uh, which is inconsistent with our observations. So the general takeaway here is that there's still no consensus among all of our models on uh, on what are all of the are we taking into account all of the necessary physics for uh, for understanding the formation of the uh, millimeter continuum. So, any questions so far? All right. All right. So uh, it would be really nice if we could observe both uh, both of these bands at once. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not really possible with Alma. Uh, there's a lot of uh, setup that goes into uh, getting it ready to observe in a certain band. And we're limited by the uh, how well we can sample the the uh, UV plane, uh, how well we can uh, get the physical structures on uh, on large scales, especially. So that's not really an option for Alma, but it turns out we can cheat because as uh, Momo found the uh, the uh, three millimeter continuum strongly correlates to the H alpha line width. So using this relation, we can create a band three proxy to compare with band six. And if we do that, you can see that there are some very nice similarities, uh, but there are also differences like the relative intensities of uh, some of these brighter regions, but still, that's very, uh, very potentially useful. So overall, these are the main takeaways from this section, from this part. Uh, chromospheric temperatures are really hard to measure. Uh, the, uh, the work that we've done here it's promising, but it raises more nagging questions. Like how distinct are the formation heights of these element bands? Uh, how do the limitations of our inversion code affect the results? Because our inversion code uh, assumes a plain parallel atmosphere inverting each pixel separately. It assumes hydrostatic equilibrium, uh, which the solar atmosphere is definitely not static. And it assumes uh, time independence. So, it, so if you have, say, a shock coming through, ionizes some gas, it what, expands and cools, and then you have this cool but highly ionized gas that can confuse the, uh, the inversion code. <coughs> and then, of course, what, these really cold uh, temperatures that band six sees is this like, what's the deal with that? So, any questions thus far? Let's go ahead. All right. Moving on. So, where does Alma actually form? Where does that radiation actually come from? Well, we can try to uh, to get a handle on that using wave propagation. So, you have. If you remember, I mentioned those acoustic waves that propagate up from the, from the photosphere. And we see those in spectral lines as, the, uh, as these regular 
shifts in velocity, usually with a period of around three minutes, give or take. And if you observe two diagnostics, say two spectral lines and their Doppler velocities uh, over time, then the uh, time difference between when one shifts versus the other tells you the, uh, the separation between those lines in physical height, assuming a certain sound speed, say seven kilometers a second. <clears throat> and among the many uh, efforts towards this end is uh, Vecchio et al. 2009, which I believe Kevin and Gianna were the co-authors on. Uh, and this was looking at the uh, IM1 7090 and calcium 2 8542 lines. And they were able to see, uh, to identify these uh, you know, waves coming through in both of these lines and uh, using the, look, the phase differences between those lines, uh, they get a delay of about 120 seconds so using a sound speed of seven kilometers a second, that gives you a separation of around 800, 900 kilometers, give or take. So if these waves are visible in Alma, then maybe we can do the same thing there. Now, there has been some previous work uh, looking at wave propagation in Alma as opposed with respect to other diagnostics. Uh, for instance, uh, Chai et al. 2022, uh, where they looked at umbral oscillations and they could see and identify these, uh, these acoustic waves propagating up from the, uh, from the center of the sunspot and showing up in Alma as these uh, temperature variations. Uh, in the quiet sun, however, it's, uh, it's been a bit harder to do that. Uh, for example, uh, Jeff Rizada et al. 2021 found that in all of the quietest regions, there's very little, if any, signature of these uh, P-mode oscillations. Uh, Momo found that the... Uh, there's not enough acoustic flux uh, to maintain the uh, the temperatures in the chromosphere, uh, but there might be a slight wrinkle to that uh, because a recent paper by Tar et al., which Kevin again is a co-author on, <coughs> uh, found that maybe part of the reason why we don't see a lot of uh, a lot of three minute power in the alma observations might have something to do with the uh with the way that those observations are conducted because when alma is observing the sun it observes for some minutes and then it has to point to something else like a, a quasar or something for calibration and uh, it has to do that for several minutes, typically. So you might have a 10 minutes of observations, three minutes of calibration, 10 minutes, three minutes, 10 minutes, three minutes. And uh, the uh, end result of that is that it actually, this spectral windowing ends up uh, dispersing some of your, uh, some of your frequency power and muddling it. Uh, so maybe this, uh, approach of looking at an entire time series at once and doing the correlations uh, to cross power between that. Maybe, maybe we need a different approach, such as uh, epoch analysis. So, if we can identify the uh, the temperature response of a individual wave. Uh, coming through the chromosphere and figure out when do those responses happen with respect to calcium lines, say, then we can get the, uh, the phase lag, the time difference, and thereby the height difference. So 
to do that, we use these observations taken in December 2018. Uh, again, this is a coordinated observing campaign between uh, IBIS, Abu Dhan, and Alma. And we got observations in several lines. We got uh, iron 6173, uh, we got potassium 7699, calcium 8542, and also H alpha. And you can see that there's a little bit of uh, network here and a lot of uh, more modeled looking quiet sun structure as well. So the, uh, the main signature of these uh, three minute waves is this sawtooth pattern in the calcium line. And uh, so we can take advantage of that to establish, uh, to define the, uh, the start of a wave. Uh, did I skip a slide? No. Okay, I must have changed something. So we can uh, effectively define the uh, the start of a wave as the local maximum of the rate of change of the velocity. So where it's most steep here, and uh, just threshold that. And by doing that, we identify all of these uh, acoustic waves in the uh, calcium line. And this is just a, a plot of all the waves in the Alma field of view that we identified. And you can see, once again, that uh, there's not many at all in the network region. They're mostly in the quiet sun. And then for each of these waves, we're going to search a, uh, a appropriate time range. So in this case, we uh, extract the velocities of the calcium line. Uh, shoot, I'm running short on time. Uh, we extract the velocities from calcium and compare that to the temperatures in Alma over a wide uh, range of you know, times. So here we go, uh, I believe it's uh, four time steps before this uh, maximum steepness to eight time steps after in the calcium, and then double that for the uh, Alma time range. And then we uh, use the Fourier cross correlation uh, to find where this maximum occurs, where what the uh, time shift is. So for example, if you compute the Fourier cross correlation uh, between the mean uh, velocity and mean on the temperature uh, of the waves, then you get this sort of a sombrero looking uh, thing and the location of that peak right there, that is what we try to find for each individual uh, wave. And so if we do, and so we know that this works because again, we've done it with other lines. Uh, if you do it with the uh, uh, potassium and iron, then you get a, a small separation of about 100 kilometers calcium and potassium, they're about 600 kilometers apart, give or take, uh, according to this uh, method, although there is a lot of variation across the field of view. So if we do this for Alma, then the epic analysis does manage to find a fairly good counterpart for most of these uh, waves that we detect in the calcium line. And this is a histogram of the inferred uh, time difference between when the maximum blue shift occurs in the calcium line and when the maximum temperature uh, deviation occurs in Alma. And you can see that they vary over quite a wide range from less than a hundred from more than 100 seconds before to more than 200 seconds after 
So assuming that seven kilometers a second velocity, that's a height range of uh, what? of minus a thousand to plus two thousand kilometers, which you're probably saying, hold on. I thought you said that the uh, calcium and the potassium lines were only 600 kilometers apart. What gives? Well, I don't know. Maybe maybe some of these uh, what, these Alma counterparts aren't actually uh, due to the same acoustic wave propagating through. Maybe there's some false positives in there. I don't know. This is very preliminary. But the general conclusion here is that uh, just the variations in where the uh, the uh, continuum, the nonlinear continuum forms, might just be confounding any sort of a uh, nice, neat correlation. So that might be bad news for any hopes of using Alma as a quote unquote simple diagnostic of wave dynamics. Uh, so in summary, time domain Alma is both useful and frustrating. Uh, yes, it would be nice to uh, to directly measure uh, the temperature enhancements from these acoustic waves and to know exactly where the Alma forms with respect to calcium. But uh, yeah, it turns out it's a lot more complicated than we would like, and then the, uh, the simulations would have led us to believe. So general conclusions here, uh, chromospheric temperatures are really hard to measure accurately and reliably. Uh, Alma, the millimeter continuum, can directly measure a temperature, but exactly where that temperature is, is not super uh, easy to determine. Uh, it's, it probably requires uh, knowledge of the electron density along your line of sight, which is really hard to measure. And especially in dynamic environments, there are interpretations are also limited by the assumptions baked into our current models and methods plane parallel, hydrostatic, Saha, equilibrium, all of that. Uh, maybe neural networks with baked in physics can help us in the future, but uh, there's still a lot of work to do on that front. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's it. Well, sorry for all the stuttering and I will take any questions. Yeah, so uh, um, in room people just uh, ask questions and online participants just unmute yourself and ask questions. All right, so uh, I wanted to ask about the inversions, uh, the calcium 8542 and band six inversions. Uh, if you can go back to, to one of those slides. This one? Yeah, so uh, maybe go to the, the maps of the inversion temperatures. Uh, I think that would be a little bit better. But uh, so the, the, uh, the, the first one, I think that was, that oh, was shown. The, yeah, this the comparison. Yeah, this one here, yeah. So uh, the band six, as you noted, uh, towards the top shows, you know, regions of very, a region of very cold temperature, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which may or may not lie within the chromosphere. But so if, you know, if we're accepting the idea that the 8542 and band six form at the same height, right? And so it's, you know, roughly, right? And if those temperatures, uh, so if those temperatures represent temperatures kind of in that sort of normal calcium 8542 band, do you have to worry about essentially uh, those low temperatures kind of, you know, evacuating, you know, all of the singly ionized calcium, like would that real that would really affect the calcium formation height, right? It would. And so this seems like a situation where you might have two very different inversions, you know, possible inversions. One where you have 
calcium eighty five, you know, calcium two in that region, and band six has to do something weird, or you have no calcium two because of the cold band six mm -hmm. temperatures, and then calcium has to do something weird. Yeah, so, that's a that's a very good point, and I'm kind of leaning. Actually, I don't know if I'm leaning more towards one or the other, but uh, that's definitely a valid concern uh, regarding the uh, the lack of uh, calcium two populations where you have these really low temperatures. Uh, I'm still kind of suspicious of how low these temperatures are, like. They go down as low as 2,000 Kelvin in this coldest okay. spot, which I don't think even in the temperature minimum we see that. Do we? Simulation people? You get easily colder stuff. Let's <laughs> yeah. put the floor. Yeah. Yeah, maybe this is the sun trying to tell us that the yeah. cross chromosphere <laughs> isn't too cold. <laughs> okay. Okay, fair enough. But yes, the. The questions of how does the uh, the uh, low temperatures affect uh, whether the calcium line can even sense that region versus the uh, it's similar to how the uh, the variations in electron density ionization fraction affect uh, where the millimeter continuum is sensitive to. So I think they're similar. Uh, issues. Katie has a question. Katie, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, really, really interesting talk. Um, the I'm curious about this is you know looking at very um, detailed analysis of us of a small region mm -hmm. and in some ways trying to get like a an exact or um temperature or an exact you know height of formation and all all power to it and that's that's very very important what i'm curious about is can these kinds of diagnostics with the different bands from alma be used to for example just look at for example two areas on the sun maybe that you you know have different structures and be able to say well this one is systematically hotter, systematically more dense, systematically less dense, systematically cooler, I don't know. You know, in terms of basically relative comparisons and how's the, what's the power of ALMA to do like relative comparisons versus the exact comparisons like we're doing here, which need to be done. I'm not gonna belittle <laughs> that, but I'm also just in terms of extending the ability of ALMA to do different analysis for solar structures. Thanks. Yeah. Well, first of all, I am by no means an expert in ALMA observations, uh, but yeah, that's a that's a fair point. Uh, general statistical analysis uh, definitely does have its place and its many many uses. So yeah, you can definitely take observations like this of say a network region and a quiet region and look at how the, uh, well, how the temperatures compare is easy because that's just the, uh, the brightness temperatures that you're looking at here. Uh, as for the other stuff, uh, like- Heights the, formation and, and that sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, the, so the heights of formation, you know, again, if you have simultaneous observations in uh, appropriate spectral lines, then uh, especially in the time domain where you can actually try and trace some of this evolution of features going up or down as the case may be, then sure, you can try to, uh, try to probe that. Uh, but it's really hard to do that for things like the, uh, like the electron density, for example, uh, for that, I think we really just need to get better at our simulations, like include all of the correct uh, physics, 
uh, all of the non-equilibrium effects that become relevant in the chromosphere, uh, what is it, non-LTE, all that stuff, and get a realistic looking uh, chromosphere, something that uh, can really reproduce the, uh, the sorts of observations that we see of the real sun. And then maybe we can uh, make some final-ish judgments about that. And in the meantime, the, uh, the simulations that we have, yeah, we can still do that sort of comparative region versus region analysis. I mean, the other thing you can do, I was just thinking about this in terms of both the simulations and the observations is, I'm wondering, or this is just a question, centered a limb variation. Mm -hmm. there that... been some of it. Um, there's been a few studies of the centered limb variation uh -huh. and looking at that. That would be a good job for uh, okay. chrome and egg plus uh, single dish full disk scans. Chrome and egg plus almond would be interesting. Yeah, it would indeed. Full mm -hmm. disk on. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I can do full disk and what, 10 arc second resolutions. Cool, thanks. I have a well, two quick questions. <laughs> One is, does the standard distribution of stick um, deal with the branch travel range mediation? Can you just do inversions of ALMA with the distribution that's on um, online accessible or uh, get it from someone? I do not, I do not know for sure. I don't know if, uh, if, uh, Stick explicitly treats the Bremsstrahlung radiation separately. Uh, I think it's just yeah. RH. It's just, uh, yeah, RH. It's, it's just RH. Because it treats the bones between the free freedom in the. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Would be, yeah. Yeah. so Stick ties into that. I'm yeah. trying to think of how to input this information, but anyway, yeah, oh, yeah. No, that's talking right. about like. Um, yeah. Well, so the hard thing, I'm not sure how. Yeah, yeah the hard thing about that is that, you know, all the is giving you one number yeah. at a given point yeah. mm -hmm. and just one other. that's just an inversion within an inversion yeah. my other question was um when you when you showed the phase land that you derived towards the end of the talk um from like single waves in calcium so single like almost like peak to peak I see that that's kind of risky because, you know, you have 180 <laughs> seconds of right. signal that I think um, once you go to a phase like of 180 seconds yeah. or more, then mm -hmm. you're in a, in, a, yeah. in a tricky spot. But yeah. is there any way you could use a, a slightly larger wave train and try to fit for the modulation of those waves? Um, I know you're restricted by well, the interval. The, the wave pulse. Oh, that this one, one, yeah. Yeah. Was that the maximum sort of length of wave train that you were? So able these to observations, uh, the uh, the IBIS time series were uh, 100 time steps at 17.5 second cadence. Yeah. The ALMA observations were uh, were 600 seconds at one second cadence and then uh two minute so it's like three and a half four waves and you can have yeah. a mm -hmm. not have, you don't have a ton of that, yeah know. there's They're not a whole long. lot to uh to work with there if we had a uh continuous alma observation for say 20 minutes or yeah. something yeah, yeah. but that's not possible the way it uh, currently does its calibrations. Yeah. So I'm doing the best I can. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was just curious. I, it looks a little bit like a handmade wavelet analysis in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did, I did do some. Uh, I did play around some with uh, with wavelet analysis uh, when I was trying to figure out the best way to uh, to do this project. Uh, but for the actual, uh, here's a wave in calcium. What's where's the best match for a wave in Alma, yeah. and what's the time separation between that? This was the best that I found yeah. for a method to do that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.
Uh, I'm not very surprised by, by your result that uh, it's a mess when you compare with Facebook, <laughs> with Alma, and calcium because the two diagnostics formula come kind of a different way. And uh, mm -hmm. when you have a short propagating through a chromosphere, I think Hendrik Eklund had a paper last two, two, two years ago now, for like, where they show how what you measure is actually a propagating front. And at some point, you become less opaque in certain wavelengths and you start measuring different velocities. So actually what you're measuring might not be just actual velocity in the atmosphere. It's kind of continuous. It's like more like the difference of velocities. Uh, like, sorry, velocities measure at different heights. It's fixed. It's more like a shock's propagating up. And it's kind of entrancing a bunch of opaque material that you kind of see in your observations. So I think that... So like you're talking about the... Uh, the effective formation height yes. the mm -hmm. wave. Yeah. Yes, and I think what you're seeing here is that is you're not seeing like different height of formation in, in a way. That's why you see such a, such a massive difference. Mm -hmm. So I think like a I think a, a, like a step out of this to make sense is just take one of these big simulations, synthesized ball, and see what and basically redo this calculation of the simulation and see what you get. But why are the temperatures and the velocities riding different? Because yeah. we have different parts. In a non constant, in a random I want to say difference different. in opacities, right? There's no there's no set pattern here between the two. Yeah. Sure. Right? Yeah. So it's not I don't know. It's very different behavior. Yeah. But I don't think you're gonna be seeing constant. High difference of formation between the two that you can apply this analysis. Well, but we see that with the photospheric and the chromospheric. We see if I look at potassium and calcium, I see a nice constant. Because that's like way lower in the atmosphere. Well, the calcium isn't. The calcium's way up higher. But I, I, I think that's because you're looking at like one of your diagnostics is, is kind of nice from way lower. Whereas when I start going in the upper atmosphere, like okay. Henry's paper showed that you kind of whatever you're seeing in the upper chromosphere is just this front moving up. So you kind right. of one nicely photosphere one. This one can't be doing random things because then you wouldn't get good coherence and sure. phase. So here's so my has question. To have some <laughs> here's my question. Though. Response. If if the if the height of formation is riding the uh, wave train, then wouldn't you expect a, a longer period overall for these for an individual uh, pulse in the alma? I would expect like something on the lifetime of the on the radiative cooling time. Or like, no, it's gonna be like recombination time or something. Right. So it's, it's gonna be like how long you're opaque at the alma. And that's that's you yeah. mean like the not the 30 second, 30 to 60 second uh oscillations that you saw? I think we need to look into Herrick's paper. Because Herrick calculated that. Like Herrick Eklund, he has a paper about how shocks propagate in Bifrost and how this changes the height of formation. Hmm. And I, I think that has something to do with this observation. So I, I have it synthesized, so I can give the cube to you if you want to look into it. So, yeah. But I think like doing this analysis is a bit misleading because I don't think you have constant heights. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, it's not the constant height, it's the constant the difference between the yeah. Two. yeah. Sure. That when, yeah, I mean, I will yeah. take calcium to the constant height, but it has a regular behavior. Well, with under that sort of regular. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean. so the alma is less well behaved. Yes. Yes. I, I think. Because, yeah. I mean, we've yeah. we done this with like for the straight lines mm -hmm. on 10 and 30, which is even higher. Mm -hmm. you, still, you still see a phase shift that is. Mm -hmm. More consistent, right? Yeah. No, yeah, it's more consistent. I think that Alma really, technically, really yeah. gets contribution from a lot of different, yeah, like it's very physically different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Other questions from online or room? If not, let's thank our speaker again. <laughs>